Good morning and welcome back to uh, online sermon with Augusta Community Church in the Dearborn Chapel. Glad that you're with us. Last week we had a little bit of a glitch and didn't get out till Sunday afternoon, but we're back this Sunday morning and thankful that you're with us. And happy Father's Day. A uh, great day where we remember the role of fathers in the family. All too often in our society, fathers are sort of diminished and left out, but uh, we can't uh, say enough about the importance of the role of the father in the life of uh, his wife and his kids and those uh, who go on from his generations. Uh, give me, let me give you an example of someone uh, that comes to us as a, as a young man who was influenced by his father, James Boswell, uh, born October 29th, 1740, died May 19th, 1795. He once said, men are wise in proportion, not to their experience, but to their capacity for experience. It was said that Boswell often talked about their, a special day when he was young, when his father took him fishing. He often reflected on the many things his father taught him in the course of their fishing experience together. After having heard of that particular excursion so often, it occurred to someone much later to check the journal that Boswell's father kept and determine what had been said about the fishing trip from the parent's perspective. Turning to that date, the reader found only one sentence entered and it said, gone fishing today with my son, a day wasted. How important it is for fathers to realize their impact on their sons and daughters. Here was something that stayed with this son, James Boswell, for the total of his life. That one day of fishing with his father, the experiences, the things that he learned from that time. And to his father, it seems something trite, something, uh, I don't know if we accomplished anything. How important it is for us as fathers to recognize the influence we have over our sons and daughters. Simple experiences that can give lasting memories, simple experiences that serve to build character into their lives. Heavenly Father, as we begin this morning, we pray that you would watch over every person that's listening, that you would open up minds and hearts to hear the truth of your word and the greatness of who you are and what you've done for us in this world. Things that come to us every day that so often we're not aware of and we don't, uh, we don't, take the time to thank you for as we should. And we don't let them; these things lead us to you as they should, as, they, as you want them to. And so we pray today that we would be led towards uh, your word, towards the truth of your word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, his love of us and his finished work to save us, and the truth of all of that. So thank you for this time. In your name, Jesus. Amen. We've concluded our study of Hebrews, and uh, we'll be starting another book study in the early fall. But in the summer months, I just want to take us through some different topics from the Bible and look at some different things until we begin another book study in the fall. If, if someone were to ask you to define biblical doctrine, biblical doctrines, what would you say? What kind of definition would you give? And this morning in, in, in Augusta Church in Dearborn, I want to ask that question. I want to see if people even give me some answers. I can't do that with you here. So let me give you a, a simple definition of biblical doctrine. It's what the whole Bible teaches us about some particular topic. That's what, we, what we're talking about when we're talking about biblical doctrines. In, in the Bible, we can say, we can understand that there are seven major doctrinal themes in the Bible. There's the doctrine of God's word. There's the doctrine of God, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of Christ and the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the application of redemption, the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the future. Those are the seven major doctrine headings in the Bible. But under each one of these headings are many subheadings of other doctrines that we find within Scripture. Let's just take one of those examples as an example as we think of the doctrine of redemption, the application of redemption. Underneath that title, are subjects like election, or the call of the gospel, or conversion, or justification, or adoption, or sanctification, or baptism, or walking in lifelong faith, uh, the doctrine of death, the doctrine of glorification, 
the doctrine of our union with Christ. There's all those things under that one heading, and there's others. Today, though, without getting very complicated, I want us to spend some time exploring uh, one other truth under that heading, one that is a truth that's constantly in front of us, and yet so often we spend little time thinking about it in, in context of this is something that God has presented to us. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, we read, The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. God had warned Adam specifically that if they, and Eve, as she was created just a short time later, that if they disobeyed the one distinctive he had given them to not do, that they would die. And when they did disobey, sin entered into their lives, into the world, and the consequence of sin, which is death, because the wages of sin is death, we know in Romans, which is death, that death began its work. But uh, because of grace from God, that death sentence did not happen right away. God in his mercy gave them many more years of life until death finally took them. Throughout history and to this day, for all those who sin against God, which is everyone, he does not necessarily cause them to die and go to hell right away, but generally gives many years of life. But in 2 Peter 2, 4, we see something different when we read that God was not that way with the angels who sinned and rebelled in heaven along with Satan. For there it says, For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. So we see that even over sinful humanity, God has given much grace. Can you name something that you can be thankful for? Not necessarily something we might designate as spiritual. Just what are a lot of different things we can be thankful for in the life that we live? Uh, I'm going to ask that question to our congregation. I want to hope to get responses. But this morning with you, I'll just say, and, and you're probably thinking along the same lines as I am, that the next beat of my heart I'm thankful for. Uh, the next breath that I take that sustains my life, that brings oxygen into my body and replenishes my cells and makes everything work. Uh, I'm thankful for appliances that make life easier in the kitchen for my wife, even sometimes for me. I'm thankful for clothes. For uh, I'm thankful for a, an old, worn pair of jeans that are comfortable to put on. I'm thankful for running water, for uh, showers and, and washing dishes and for drinking. And, and I'm thankful for consciousness that I can be aware of the reality of which I live in. I'm thankful for family, for friends. I'm thankful for things like vehicles and, and uh, coffee. That's one of the really good things in life. I'm thankful for rain. I'm thankful for lawns. Uh, all of those things and many, many more come under a heading that we call common grace. How can we define common grace? Well, the definition of common grace is this. Common grace is the grace of God by which he gives people innumerable blessings that are not part of salvation. Innumerable blessings that are not part of salvation. Wayne Grudem wrote a book about systematic theology. And in there, he states that common grace comes to us in, a, in various forms or various realms. Uh, the first one that he talks about is the physical realm. Every breath an unbeliever takes is by God's grace. It's, it's by God's grace because the wages of sin is death. The world we live in is able to produce the food and materials we need in order to live and even prosper. God gives us things so that we can just live. Acts chapter 14, verses 16 through 17 says, In the past... He, God, permitted all the nations to go their own ways. They could just go their own ways without him, but he never left them without evidence of himself and his goodness. For instance, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. In the physical realm, God is there. In the intellectual realm, the Bible tells us that everyone knows the truth of God. 
but because of sin in our own lives, because of the influence worldwide of Satan, we have this tendency to suppress that understanding of God and his way and his truth and the life that he offers. John 8, 44 tells us, For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. In the dispensing of common grace, God wants people everywhere to see his gift of life and come to him in the way he is, pres he is prescribed. But deception, apathy, can lead people to become involved in man-made religions or even make them up. It is God's desire that common grace will lead people to the gospel of salvation. Then there's the moral realm. God, by the giving out of common grace, allows people to be kept far short of the moral depravity, the sin and the evilness that they're really capable of. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 through 15 tells us, Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts, for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. Common grace affords a measure of stability within a world that has fallen from God. Then there's a creative realm in art, in music, all other areas where creativity is needed. God allows people these gifts. Many times unbelievers have greater gifts of creativity than those who are believers. I think right away of Herod the Great, a mean, vindictive king who was king over Israel, who murdered members of his own family, yet was so creative in many ways. Herod rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. He built Caesarea by the sea, which was an engineering feat of great magnitude. Uh, he built Masada in the desert on top of a mountaintop. But in all cases of the past and present, men and women's creativity is because of God's common grace. And then there's a societal realm. It was God who instituted the family. Uh, after the birth of Seth, Adam lived another 800 years and he had other sons and daughters, Genesis 5, verse 4. God brought about governments after the flood and its importance is confirmed in Romans 13. Everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. And then the religious realm. Even the unbelieving world is influenced by God's common grace, as many strive to love their neighbors, strive uh, even to love those who seem unlovable, even those who seem, uh, who, who seem to be enemies. Even unbelievers desire to do good for others around them and for the world as a whole. Many religions work continuously to try and bring about a man-made utopia, which history and even the present world and times indicate cannot happen by men's means. Within common grace is the proclamation of the gospel, that Jesus Christ is Lord and King and will someday return to rule the earth and vanquish sin and all of its corruption that is brought about in human hearts and in creation. This message is given even to those who refuse to believe and it becomes, this common grace, becomes a testament to the fact that God through his grace is not willing that any should perish. Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11 tells us, As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so that they can live. Turn, turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel, and us too. Why should you die, he says in that verse. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. You see, common grace calls out to the world to live now and eternally through Jesus Christ. So we should see that in all those realms of common grace, which are wonderful gifts to all, man, to all of mankind, especially to unbelieving mankind, Common grace is not saving grace. 
Common grace does not fundamentally change the human heart to bring it to repentance toward God and to receive his forgiveness through faith in Jesus and his finished work. As good as common grace is, and as much as it helps people become good, as much as it contributes to a stability in the world, it in no way makes a person good enough to be justified in God's eyes, to be worthy of a relationship with God and life eternal with God. Saving faith comes to those who take to heart the words of Jesus Christ himself when he says, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. John 5, verse 24. You see, common grace is meant to make us aware of saving grace. Saving grace that came about when Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. Folks, how good common grace is as it shouts to us as we live our lives on this earth. In contrast, how great, how awesome, how fantastic, how loving is saving grace that brings us worthiness for eternal life. I hope and I pray, as always, that each one of us as we look at the scriptures, we see these different contrasts. We understand the goodness of God to bring common grace to each and every person on this earth, but that that common grace would reach out and bring saving grace to each and every person. May you be blessed today in your walk with the Lord. Thank you for being with us.